declare this morning that that's why we're here. We're here to set aside a portion of our time to focus on you. And so Jesus, I pray that that sacrifice, that choice that we make to come back and prioritize you today would be met with a realization of your love, an expression of your grace, an understanding of your mercy, that we would leave church today having seen friends and met new people. But more than anything, we would, have, we would leave church today with a better understanding of how much you love us and that that would inspire us to show the world how much you love them. God, we worship you today. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Children, you are dismissed to Kids Church. And typically that means kids running away from here, which I don't take offense to. But while they're doing that, we can go ahead and watch this. Good morning. If we haven't met, my name is Jason. I'm the pastor here at Faith Discovery Church, and it is an honor that you've chosen to spend a little bit of your Sunday morning with us. I am so excited you're here. Uh, and for those of you joining us online, we're, we're excited that you're here, part of this community too. Uh, encourage you to engage each other in the chat today. Church is better when we're together. Church is better when you are here. And so uh, I'm it makes my, uh, my church experience better when I get to see you. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am really excited this morning, uh, as opposed to normally when I'm very calm and not really into it. But I'm really excited this morning. We're going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to tease it a little bit. We're going to talk about the commandment that, uh, about the Sabbath today. And Joy this week, she said, how are you going to preach a whole sermon on the Sabbath? And because she was like, what do you got, five minutes? I'm proud, no, I am proud to say I got like three weeks worth of stuff we're going to go through this morning. So buckle up, settle in. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's going to be a good day. I read a meme this week. I saw a meme this week that, 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 that said what it's like for introverts at church. Uh, the first 35 minutes, you are worried about the shaking hands time, meet and greet time. Then the meet and greet time comes and you have to suffer through the meet and greet. And then the rest of church, you are recovering from the meet and greet time. I get it. I, 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 I thank you so much for uh, humoring the rest of us so that we can enjoy church together, say hello, and uh, make sure everybody feels greeted because this is a place where everyone should feel welcome. So if you, if you dread the meet and greet, if you plan your time to get to church to just after people say hello to each other, it's okay. We're still glad you're here. Um, this morning, we are continuing our summer series on the Sinai experience. If you're new with us or if you haven't been with us in a while, let me give you some context. Uh, starting this month, and we'll do this through August, we've, we've planned our services around uh, the, the experience of the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And if, you haven't, if you're not aware of that story, if you haven't heard of that story, Mount Sinai is the place where God intended to meet with his people, the, the people of Israel, and it's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And if you haven't heard of the Ten Commandments, there's a movie that's really old and dated. You can watch that. That'll give you some context. Um, this is, yeah. There you go. Uh, many other things happened at Sinai, which is why we're calling this the Sinai experience, instead of just calling it the Ten Commandments, because there was a lot of things that happened at Sinai. They lived, uh, the Israelites camped at Mount Sinai for about a year, and there was a lot of things that happened. And so as we've been studying this, we've, we've talked about 
just to catch you up, we've been providing some background and, con and context regarding the state of the Israelites as they approached Sinai. These were people who were escaping from uh, Egypt. They, had, they were leaving 400 years of slavery. And so uh, as they come there, they are a people who are uncertain of what their future is. And they have a, they've developed a reputation very quick for being a murmuring people. They know what they don't like. Does anybody know people who knows what they don't like? Opinionated people tend to tell us what they don't like. Well, the Israelites were very uh, opinionated and they'd been in slavery for 400 years and they'd gotten so accustomed to slavery, so accustomed to being in bondage that when they experienced a little freedom, they didn't know what to do with it and it was uh, a source of tension for them. Where was their provision gonna come from? And so over and over, they're scared, they're worried, they have anxiety. Anyone experienced that in their life ever? And, uh, and they have to learn to trust that God is the person who can provide the nourishment and the sustainability for them to function. We look at the, for those of us who grew up in church, some of us look at the Israelites and they've, they're examples of how not to be. But when you peel back the onion a little bit, it's really understandable to live the life like the, Israel live, the Israelites live their life. They wanted to know where their food was. They got bored of the same food over and over. Sounds like my children. They wanted to know where their provision was. They, they wanted, they, had, they were anxious about where the next thing was. And so they lived that life and they learned to trust God brings them on this journey and teaches them that they can rely on God. That's really easy for us to talk in Christianese and Bible speak that we need to trust God. But the reality is that it's very hard sometimes, especially in a culture that tells us we have to rely on ourselves, that if we don't take care of ourselves, no one's gonna take care of us. And to turn that around and say, I understand that I believe and I trust and I'm gonna give God the opportunity to provide for me. And so that's the Israelites' experience as they're coming to Sinai. And so Moses, God gives Moses these 10 commandments. And we talked about the first one a couple weeks ago. The first one we said is worship no one but Yahweh. And I propose that this first command is comprised of three separate ideas, all of which are found in the first six verses of Exodus chapter 20. The first of verse two, it says, I am Yahweh, your God. This first element, I am Yahweh, your God, provides a rationale for limiting worship to Yahweh. Yahweh was God's, or was, is, God's name. And so God is telling them, I'm the one to worship. I am Yahweh, your God. Yahweh is the God who had set the Israelites free. And so because of that, as a response to that gift that he had given them, they are to worship him and no one else. The second and third components are you must have no other gods and you, should not make your, uh, you must not make an image of a God. They're from verses three through six and they work in tandem. No image belongs together with no other gods. Worship and images went hand in hand in the ancient world. It would have been, uh, it would not have been possible. It didn't seem relative. It would have been outside the, the norm for uh, people to possess an image that it was not worshiped. In that world, the point of images was worship and the means of worship were images. You had an image to worship it. Yahweh changed the equation. God made us in him, his image. And so that we are to worship him and not to try to create an image of him. Then last week we looked at the second command and we said it's represent Yahweh well. I suggested that the name command, do not use the Lord's name in vain, is more than just a language command. That it's better actually understood as an ethical command. God cared how the Israelites lived morally and ethically, and he called them to be holy, to be different, and to treat people differently in a way that represents him and how he sees and feels about the world. And as a result of that idea, there, the, our lives, our, 
our lives help reveal God in a world and to a world that does not know him. When we live a Christ-like life, people see Christ in a way that, they're, that isn't exposed to them otherwise. And what that does is it creates curiosity. Um, it creates an, a, a, a question of why are you different? But, we, but people will never ask us why we're different if we don't live differently. And so today we turn our attention to the third command. And so let's read from Exodus 20, verses 8 through 10. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and, make it, and made it holy. Excuse me. The third command given to the Israelites is to observe, observe the Sabbath. I like to call this one the rest command. It's the first of the commandments that flow from the covenantal formula developed and established by the first two commands. Those first two words, as, we, as, as it's actually referenced in the Bible, command one and command two, as we would call them, they flesh out wh what covenant faithfulness looks like in every conceivable way of life. Work, family, conflict, marriage, property, reputation, all that, all of the foundations that we will go through in commands three through 10 are built on the foundation of worship Yahweh alone and represent him well. Everything built on that foundation. And so this is the first one. And the Sabbath command is an interesting one, at least for me, for several reasons. One of which is that we as, as Christians today, as Protestants, we, we, we really struggle with this command. At best, we don't really understand how to observe it. At worst, or the other spectrum, is we think it's really no longer relevant to our lives. And so let's do, this morning I propose that we do a little deep, little bit deeper dive into observing the Sabbath so that we can see and learn how it can be relevant to our lives today. I think an important place for us to, to, to start in that exercise is to define what the Sabbath is and also what it is not. The word Sabbath is related to a Hebrew word that means to cease or to stop. God commanded his people to cease from their labor so that they could rest, they could refresh, and they could refuel. He had set his people free from slavery in Egypt, and as children of God, they were no longer bound to a nonstop work life. They weren't slaves anymore. And so God gives them a day of rest, a day to cease from working, but not only just to cease from working, but also to use that time to worship and honor him. The Sabbath is more than just a ceasing of labor. When we have a day off from work and maybe we spend all day in bed, sounds nice, doesn't it? Sounds boring. Resting in bed does not amount to keeping a Sabbath. Isaiah, 50, uh, Isaiah 58 tells us that the Sabbath is to be a delight and a joy. If we look again at verse 8 from Exodus chapter 20, we see that the command places the positive command of keep the Sabbath holy before it says to stop working. It doesn't say stop working first. It says the Sabbath is holy. The Sabbath is to be a day of consecration, which means dedicating yourself to the service and worship of God and to make it holy or to dedicate it to a higher purpose. So it's to be a day of consecration, a day of celebration, and a day of community. The joyous character of the Sabbath is, is, is evidenced in among, and reflected on in, in, among, in many ways, but one of which is their joy of eating together. Sabbath was about being together. So having defined the Sabbath, let's look at what the Sabbath does and why it's important. First, and this is especially meaningful to the, 
this was especially meaningful to the Israelites. Sabbath said that slavery is a thing of the past. In Egypt, Pharaoh's resistance to, to the Sabbath, we can see this actually in Exodus chapter 5. Moses and Aaron are talking to Pharaoh, and they're telling them that, that the Israelites need a day of rest. And Pharaoh is flummoxed at this idea. Uh, he, uh, this, this, this resistance to it underscores his idea of exploitive labor practices. He wanted to get as much as possible out of each of his items or possessions. You see, Pharaoh didn't look at the Israelites as people. He didn't look at them as equals. He looked at them as subjects or possessions. And any minute that they weren't producing made them less valuable to him. And so there was, an, so the idea that, they, that we would give away one seventh of production was insane. And so Moses and Aaron are, are, are asking for them, the people to be stopped from working and as opposed to Pharaoh, as opposed to Pharaoh, Yahweh guards against human exploitation in this command. And, he, and it's very intentional and it's very specific. It's not just the men in a patriarchal society that are given a Sabbath. Men, women, children, servants, immigrants, even animals are very, are very intentionally and, uh, given rest on a Sabbath. The Sabbath is for everyone. Observing the Sabbath is an expression of trust in God. When the Israelites wandered in the desert, they, before they reached the promised land, God provided them manna because they were hungry. And so we see this in Exodus 16. And, and he provides a, this bread-like substance that uh, is to be collected every morning. And, and they're very in, uh, specifically instructed that the first six days, they're only to collect enough for that day. If they collect more than enough for that day, because they want to start saving and hoarding it so that they can, like, trust in their own abilities, the manna turns to maggots, which is disgusting. But on the sixth day, God, by the way, Exodus 16, this is a little, little bit of math work for all of us this morning. Exodus 16 comes before Exodus 20. Mind blowing. And it's in Exodus 20 that we get the command to keep the Sabbath. But God kept the Sabbath right from the very start of creation. And so he tells the Israelites in Exodus 16, when you collect the manna, the first six days, uh, the first five days, collect enough for the, that, just that day. But on the sixth day, collect enough for two days so that you don't have to work on the seventh day. Right from before he even ushers his commandments, this is a principle that God has given to his people. And so um, we, read, uh, we read in Exodus 16, on the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Um, trusting in God is not always easy for us. I was reminded of this this week. Um, not everybody, and I'm not patting myself on the back here. Not everybody sees the world the way I do. I'm a Bible nerd. And I have built, some would say naively, my process, my thought process on what this says. And so if this says it, that's how I'm building my life. But not everybody finds that to be the easiest thing. And so when, when I say we need to trust in God, I was reminded that that's often, e Jason, that's easier said than done. And sometimes that's easier for you than it is for more people. Sometimes that doesn't come naturally to people. Well, I can tell you that you're not alone. If, if that doesn't necessarily come easy to you, if that doesn't come natural to you, if you, that's hard for you to compute that you can actually trust God for your provision and your protection. And you're not alone. Since the fall of man, 
One of the biggest mistakes we've made as humanity is convince ourselves that everything depends on us. And sometimes in our, in our, in our circles, that fleshes out that way. I know some of you, because I've talked to some of you, some of you in here are the one in your circle everybody depends on. Moms, that's you a lot of times. And so the idea that everybody depends on you can sometimes become overbearing and, 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 and a, st- a bigger stress and God saying, God didn't design you to carry that weight. But it's not easy for us to do it. And we, you're not alone. The reason we, they had to be told not to collect two days worth of stuff was because it was in their nature to do what? Collect two days worth of stuff. But God was teaching them in a very, very concrete uh, lesson. Trust me. Your life will go better if you trust me. I don't know how specific it is. If you trust yourself, you end up with maggots. But if you'll trust me, you'll see my provision and it's a better way of life. But it's, it's absolutely an expression of trust in God. In our culture, everything inside of us, everything we're told says it depends on us. But it's not just that. We celebrate those who never take a rest. And God's saying, I've built this pattern so that this would be, this is a sustainable, scalable system. Our bodies aren't meant to never rest. You know what happens when we don't rest? Our bodies break down and then we're forced to rest. God built us and designed us to trust in him and he is faithful to provide and to be trusted. Well, I'm way off my notes. God, God is wanting us to rely on him instead of ourselves. I know that doesn't make sense in, a world of, in the world that you got to look out for yourself, but God wants to look out for you. And he has called us to put our dependence on him. And those of us who have really struggled for dependence, for our independence, maybe we've been part of uh, abusive relationships. Maybe we've been part of uh, relationships or we've been in business with people or we've been structured with people where they, didn't, they weren't faithful and we learned we can only count on ourselves. God is calling us to put our trust in him. He is the faithful one. And so observing the fa- Sabbath is an expression of, God, of, follow, uh, of worship. I a trust in God. Observing the, the Sabbath is an example of how we follow God's example. Like I said, this goes all the way back to the garden. The creation narrative in Genesis details that the first six days of creation and chapter one and chapter two kind of tell the story differently. And whoever broke it up in chapter one, at some point in history, somebody took all this whole amount of writing and they broke it up into numbers. And chapter and verses, and that's how we can read it. It's how we identify it. But chapter one, the world is created in six days. But for some reason, it it bleeds into chapter two. And the culmination of of the seventh day experience is found in Genesis uh, Genesis two, two and three. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. It would have made really good sense if the person just made this the end of chapter one. But I digress. On the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because he rested, uh, because on it, he rested from all the work creating that he had done. God sanctified, he made holy the seventh day. He set it apart so it's not like other days. The blessing of the seventh day is an oasis of rest so that our labor doesn't have to be monotonous or oppressive. 
by setting aside a seventh day, by setting aside a day of rest, God instituted a perpetual rhythm for a human week. But he didn't live in our day. Jesus didn't live, Moses didn't live, none of those people lived in a world of cell phones and email and constant availability and 24 hour news cycles. I was listening to uh, uh, a podcast this week and the person said, remember when newspapers were important? Like you'd open the newspaper in the morning and find something out that happened? There's, they're still important, but you don't, you're not shocked by the front page anymore. You know what happens when it happens. You're, there's, we live in a world of constant availability and it's these wonderful technological advances that make us available all the time. And they're wonderful because they make us available all the time, except they make us available all the time. God set up a system where we have perpetual rest, a perpetual rhythm, so, it's, so our lives are sustainable and scalable. The Sabbath is about rest from work. By setting aside a day to rest, we are guarded against the idolatry of workaholism. It's a new word for most of us. The idea that it all depends on us and that if we just work harder, we can make it all possible. If we grip harder, if we try harder, we'll accomplish all the dreams people told us we're supposed to have. In our culture, we celebrate the go-getters. And by the way, let me make this clear. We should work hard but there must be a balance. We celebrate those who sleep less, who never take a day off. I'm gonna tell you, years ago, I was working at a church and we were studying other churches. And there's this well-named, well-known, unnamed church that I'm gonna blast a little bit here. The leader of that church was on a video, was doing an interview, was talking about how much uh, they appreciate their staff and they, they organize and they mandate a day off during the week. And he found that people, they enjoyed their job so much that they started coming in to volunteer on their day off. And he wanted to thank them for that. So he, he gave them a little stuffed flurry thing that sits on their desk. And it became this thing where people started to collect them. And then it was, let's see who's better on their day off because they come in. And the idea of having a Sabbath went right out the window and we celebrated working more, doing more. And I sat there and I was like, something's not right about that. If we are not intentional, everything in our society says work more, produce more. So you can have more stuff, so you can keep up with the Joneses. I don't know who the Joneses are, by the way, but we're all trying to keep up with them. We have to move away from the celebration of self to a reliance on the power of God. We work hard, we should. But there's got to be a balance because Sabbath is also about the enjoying the results of our work. Sabbath carves out times so that we can celebrate and enjoy the fruit of our labor. It provides a time for us to be together with all the statuses removed. If you look at the way Exodus 20, is, uh, 8 through 10 is written, On the Sabbath, the boss is not the boss. And the lower laborers are not lower laborers. 
And the stepchild is not a stepchild. And the out-of-town visitor is not an out-of-town visitor. Everybody's on the same level. We're all equal. Because Sabbath should be a day of consecration. It should be a day of uh, connection. It should be a day of celebration and it should be a day of community. But it's not about who's higher in that. When you go back to work on Monday, there might be a boss. But on the Sabbath, we're all in it together. None of us get any more than any other. We're in it together. They're part of the community. The the boss, the lower worker, they're all part of the community that's celebrating together. So here are some takeaways. I'm gonna do takeaways two different ways today. First, my kind of geeky takeaways. And then very practical ones, because I'm gonna try to be a little bit more practical with some of our takeaways. The takeaways for observing the Sabbath. First, observing the Sabbath requires planning. This does not just happen through circumstance. God told the, in Exodus 16, God told the Israelites on on the sixth day, collect two days worth of work. They had to plan for it. This became very real to me, my understanding of this during uh, COVID. Be very honest, um, Joy and I, the kids are a lot of times involved in sports or activities. Seemingly most days we're out playing the parental Uber driver. You ever, you, you know about that? And so we'd often not eat dinner till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And at 7.30 and 8 o'clock at night, neither Jordan or I wanted to cook. We're exhausted. And so for pre-COVID, we did a lot of takeout. We would do takeout a couple times a week because it was just easier. Then COVID happened and for a while, the restaurants are shut down and everybody's home. And so we started planning out our meals. We didn't want to go to the store a lot. And so we sat down and we regulate, we, we planned out what we were going to do for the week. And then we planned the grocery store order. Some of you are like, how could you have not been doing that all along? Don't judge me. And our grocery shopping became way more efficient when we planned it out. And the meals were good. We had a bigger variety. Everything worked because we worked the plan. But it only works if you got a plan. Something's going to happen on the Sabbath. Promise you, you start trying to observe the Sabbath, that's when the emergencies are going to happen. So what's your plan to deal with the emergencies? The Sabbath doesn't happen. Observing a Sabbath doesn't happen by accident. It requires planning. So next, the next thing is it requires order. Chaos. Some of us thrive on chaos. Some of you are really good at that. Chaos makes the Sabbath or rest more difficult to attain. So God gives very dis- distinct guardrails for how the system of Sabbath was supposed to work. We need, we need or- God brings order into the chaos. If you've got a chaotic life, bringing God into that will help you pr- have more structure and thus be able to observe a Sabbath. Observing the Sabbath regulates equality. It, make, it, 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 it takes intentionality to see those who are different than you or are on a different status level than you as equal or as level so that you can celebrate and appreciate who they are. When you come to a place where you says, where you say, I don't know why I would say you says, but where you say, not everything relies on me. You start to appreciate the contribution of others around you. If you've come to a place where you say, I feel like everything relies on me. My challenge to you is to start to identify what you appreciate or celebrate in the others around you. Because it will take away some of the stress. You'll start to see the contribution of others. 
fourth of the, the geeky ones, we'll call them. Celebrate, uh, observing the Sabbath creates opportunities to flourish holistically. The Sabbath is consecrated, it's um, celebrated, it's to, it's to consecrate, it's to celebrate, and it's to find community. When we observe the Sabbath, we are holistically uplifted. We are cared for spiritually. Because we've added an element of spirituality to it. We are cared for physically because endless work is unsustainable. We're cared for emotionally. Did you know that observing the Sabbath is a form of self-care? Being intentional about making sure you're trusting in God more than yourself is one of the ways we care about ourselves. It's relationally. It, it creates opportunities to flourish relationally because it levels the playing field and it raises the appreciation you have of other people and of God. When you realize it doesn't all depend on you and God's gonna provide for you, he's gonna take care of you, he's gonna help you flourish, you appreciate him more and you feel less anxiety about it. Doesn't mean you're not gonna be stressed, doesn't mean you're not gonna have concerns, doesn't mean you're not gonna ask yourself this all the time, how is God gonna do this? I don't know how, but he always does. The amount of times that Joy and I have looked at each other and said, I don't know how God's gonna take care of this. Rivals or equals the amount of times that we look at each other and we say, I don't know how God did that. And then you know what we say next? I don't know how he could do it again. Because we're programmed to think we got to rely on ourselves. And it's really hard to bring us to a place where we're really committed to relying on him. So hopefully in a perfect world, in my dream world, you've convinced, you've been convinced this morning that the Sabbath is worth honoring and keeping holy. But how exactly do we do that? So I have real quick, I'm going to bullet point them. Nine practical tips for, uh, for in, how we can enjoy and benefit fully from the Sabbath. First, work enough on the first six days that you don't have to work, that you can rest on the seventh day. Well, that's the very theoretical. Let me break it down even more. If you're a student and you declare that Sunday's gonna be your Sabbath and you know you have some work due Monday morning, have it done by Saturday night. You might have to work harder in the six days so that you can res reserve the Sabbath. It will pay off beneficially for you. You know what? This isn't a message about tithing, but somehow God makes the 90% of my money when I tithe go farther than the 100% of my money when I don't. It's the same with time. It's the same with our treasure. When we give God a portion of it and say, I'm gonna rely and trust in you with this, somehow it expands. I can't scientifically prove it. I can just say experientially, it's never failed. First, work enough on the six days so that you can actually rest. Second, pause the rat race. A lot of this stuff comes from an article that I, if you want, I can give it to you, it's got longer elements of it. But the illustration that the article talks about for number two and number three is a, is a treadmill. Imagine you're in a room where everybody's on a treadmill and you're like, you find yourself competing for how long uh, it's gonna go. And then you get to day seven and you gotta decide, am I getting off this treadmill or am I staying on? Cause I wanna compete with everybody else in the room. To, an observe, to observe the Sabbath, you gotta stop thinking that you gotta beat the Joneses on day seven and you gotta give that away and get off the treadmill. Pause the rat race. You gotta be willing to trust that God's gonna do more in the six than you can do in the seven. Not only does you pause the rat race, don't, not only do you step off the treadmill, but you take time to enjoy the view and to smell the roses. That's number three. 
You gotta go outside the room. When I read this, I thought of my front porch. I love my front porch. My front porch is one of my favorite places in the world. I love to watch it rain when, it's, when I'm sitting on my porch and you see the weather just roll through. We have to take time in our lives to enjoy the view and to smell the flowers. God does great things in our lives, but we have to acknowledge that. Four, you gotta go to church. For, those, for some of you, you're like, yeah, well, we do that. Jason, we're all here today. Yes, thank you. When some of you experience, when you make a commitment to start going to church, all of a sudden, tons of things come in your way as to why you can't go to church. And yes, I know I say it often, when we say yes to something, we're saying no to all the other things. You gotta say no to all the other things and come to church. Why? Because we could hear you yell. I yell sometimes, I admit it. It's not about me. It's about carving out a time that says, God, I'm devoting this to you. Being at church is part of having a Sabbath. Fifth, keep your activity on the Sabbath non-vocational. You work hard enough. Enjoy. Sabbath isn't just about like sitting still and doing nothing. It's about different, segmented. Keep your activities. For instance, today, this afternoon, I'm going to go watch Jonah play basketball. I love watching my kids play sports. Joy does not enjoy me watching my kids play sports as much. You think I yell here? Just a wonderful like getaway, totally separate activity. And I find community in the parents and they all know I'm a pastor and they all think I'm crazy. So they're by, right on both parts. And they'll ask about church and all this kind of stuff. Whether they come here or not, it's just me being in the community and fine. But it's, it's, a non, it's not me about being there to like pastor the people. I'm there non-vocationally separating the time today. Six, that's six, yeah. Avoid work email. Don't look at your email on the Sabbath. Well, it's only gonna be a second. You know how often a second or two of looking at your emails turns into 45 minutes to an hour? Carve out the time to really take the Sabbath, to separate yourself from that stuff. Seven, take a nap. When I was a kid, we had church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and in the middle, my parents would take a nap and they would make us take a nap. And there was nothing worse. I mean, football was on or baseball was on or basketball, sports kind of dominated my life. Maybe bowling was on, if nothing else. I got things to do. No, go take a nap. Take a nap. The world will keep going if you, car if you take some time. Number eight, second to last one, be a good neighbor. Focus on somebody else in your community. Is there somebody who, who can use your help or a kind, might, might not be an action, maybe it's just a kind word. But you're focused on your community and not necessarily your stuff. Nine, take some time to do family devotions. Well, Jason, we, we already went to church. Yeah, if you've got kids in kids' church, ask them about their lesson. Talk to them about how your family can practically implement this. Ask them what they disagreed with. Ask people in your family what, you didn't what they didn't like about what I said in church. Here's the deal. If all of us agree on everything, some of us aren't necessary. If you agree with everything I say, Our faith should be something we wrestle through. We wrestle it together. If you're single, if, you're, if you don't necessarily have a family to do it with, you don't have kids, that's fine. Find a group of people to do it with. We're all family.
go to the park and journal. Find a way to make this different. Because if you'll do that, you open the door to availing yourselves to God's blessing. Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, God, I do this for a living and there are times where it's hard for me to do this. Help us to carve out the time for you. Help us to trust you. God, I pray that you would do incredible, tangible miracles in a way just to show us that we can trust you. You have always done it. And I know you will always do it. But God, in very tangible ways, we need you to do it. Because we want to honor you, we want to follow your example, and we want to position ourselves to represent you in the world. We want to worship you alone. In your name we pray. Amen.